Uh, today, Morality, Miracles, and Prophecy, that's not the same title I had used previously, but it's because as in my own study through this week, I decided I wanted to spend, or that we needed to spend, I think, a little bit more time on the argument for God from moral law. Now, I know all of you all have read by now the uh, C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, right? Well, Mere Christianity, obviously, uh, Lewis takes a long section early on in that book to argue from the moral law, and he does a brilliant job of it. But coming across some other things uh, in my own studies this past week, I decided that I wanted to spend a little more time on that, because to me, the two most significant arguments for the existence of God, the reality of God, are the teleological argument, that is the argument from design, that says that, you know, the, the world, the universe, is simply too exact in its design for it to have happened by accident, and people, the, the watchmaker analogy, everybody can get that, all right? As a watch uh, insists on the existence of a watchmaker, so a universe which is more complex than that demands a creator. And then you get into the fine-tuning aspect of that, etc. Uh, well, that, the teleological argument, the watchmaker analogy kind of argument, and the moral argument, to me, are the two most compelling in the modern world today. Uh, Pam, we've got chairs up here. Um, I mean, wherever you want to sit, but if you'd like a table, you can sit next to Barbara or up here, either one. Um, so, the moral argument, particularly, I think people can get as well in terms of why what everyone consistently believes about morality cannot be so in the absence of, a, of God. So we'll talk about that a little bit more today. So we'll talk about morality, miracles, and prophecy as other categories of apologetics. In, in the study notes you will get more detail about I actually give you three slightly different versions of the moral argument in those notes. And I'll, I'll get into the third one of those today. Two of them I presented to you before, I think. Um, to get us started, uh, this is the button I need to push right there. This is class. Next week we're going to talk about responding to the new atheists. And again, in the study notes, you will see the last few questions are about the new atheists. There's nothing particularly new about the new atheism. Um, the only thing that's that's really new about it is they seem to be mad, um, and and they're they're convinced that. Um, in fact, they consider it an obligation on their part, the new atheists, that is the Richard Dawkinses and Christopher Hitchens died in 2011, he was one of the main ones, uh, the Sam Harrises and Daniel Dennings and others, that they have an obligation to try to obliterate religious belief. I mean, that is not exaggerating. They believe that you, they have an obligation to try to stop society from having any religious belief. That it not only is not they don't, they don't think reasonable, but they think it's counterproductive, and it's actually damaging. One of um, Richard Dawkins' books was, uh, God is not great. And the point there is, God is not only not great, God is not good. They, they attribute most of the evil in the world to religious belief. And so we'll talk about that next week. We'll get into, I think it's important for us to know about that, because that is the form. That's the face of most modern anti religious beliefs, and especially anti-Christian beliefs. Interestingly enough, some of them, like Sam Harris, has written several books which are specifically anti-Islamic. Um, there's a woman, whose name I'm not remembering off the top of my head, who was from a, an Arabic Muslim culture, and she and a good friend of hers did a, a documentary which was declaring Islam to be evil, etc., while the filmmaker was killed, and she was her life was threatened, and so she'd been in hiding for a long time. But they are, a lot of them are considered um, not only anti-Islamic, but they're labeled as Islamophobes, meaning they have an inherent fear of Islam. I don't like the whole phobe thing. Anytime you disagree with somebody, you can call them a, a, a fill-in-the-blank phobe. And so they're fearful of it. Maybe they're not fearful of it. Maybe they just don't agree with it. Yeah. But in this case, um, they have been pretty radical in, in terms of their scathing criticism of Islam, as well as Christianity. Right? So we'll talk about that a little bit next week. Today, morality, miracles, and prophecy on the 20th. We will talk about applying the principles. What do you do with this stuff? And then in the first hour, the second hour, we will have our final exam. As always, I encourage you to go through the study notes, spend time with them, and then plan on taking the final exam, even if you're not doing this for credit. Because if you, if you study this material with that as your expectation that you're going to take the test, 
even if it's not for credit, you will learn more. You will come away from this class with more content and more benefit if you think in terms of, I'm getting ready for this test. It's, there is a reason why schools always give tests, at least anyone that knows what they're doing, um, because of that. It does make a difference. So, I encourage you in that. I want to start out today talking about, uh, first, any, any questions from your reading? You all, those of you who have purchased the books, you've got three books you're reading. You're reading the very straightforward sort of outline of evidential, and, and this is the perfect example of evidential apologetics, is, uh, is uh, ah, Josh McDowell's book. Um, Josh McDowell's book, it lists all this evidence. That's called evidential, uh, evidential apologetics. Uh, classical apologetics, which I'm going to talk about a little bit today, both uses philosophical arguments like the ontological argument, the teleological argument, etc. Those are logical arguments for God. Plus, they look at the evidence for miracles, prophecy, etc. Uh, that's classical apologetics, sort of incorporates evidential doesn't do some kind of rationalistic arguments or rational arguments, they focus entirely on evidence, and Josh McDowell's book is a good example of that. You then have um, C.S. Lewis, which is a wonderful sort of, again, Mere Christianity is the most important Christian book I believe written in the 20th century, and I'm not the only person who thinks that. So if you haven't read it, you need to, and you need to spend time with it. Um, and then the third book, which is the perfect example of philosophical apologetics, is um, the William Lane or William Craig, William Lane Craig's book um, on reasonable faith, and that's the toughest one. That's sort of in ascending order of difficulty. You know, you've got the just fact, 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 fact stuff of Josh McDowell, and then this sort of uh, very clearly thought through arguments from moral law and human experience that you get in Lewis, and then you get the very high philosophy uh, of William Lane Craig. So, any questions about any of that stuff? Are you enjoying the books, or at least benefiting from the books? Okay, you're not enjoying them. Uh, I would think you would enjoy them. I love this stuff. Um, all right, I want to start out today then talking about um, the, the Christian faith in classical apologetics, which means dealing both with uh, philosophical arguments and also evidential. There is a 12-point outline, or 12 propositions, which are often put forward as being kind of the summary statement, and I probably could have done this in the introduction, but I want to do it today because we're going to hit on a couple of things today. These 12 propositions build on one another in order to make a sort of comprehensive three-dimensional diagram of what Christian apologetics is about. First, the idea that truth about reality is knowable. We are not really lost in a fog like Jacques Derrida or other, you know, the modern, um, you know Jacques Derrida? Uh, his name was really Jack, but he changed it to Jacques because it sounded cooler. Um, he was a philosopher who um, was really, he died in uh, 2004, I think it was, 2004? And probably the most influential, influential philosopher of the um, late 20th, early 21st century. His philosophy influenced everything. He, he put forward what's known as deconstructionism. Deconstructionism says basically, there is no truth, and if there was, you couldn't know it, so stop trying. Hmm. And it, the, the ramifications of that have affected everything from seriously affecting literary criticism, all the way down to things like architecture. How many of you all know the EMP project building in Seattle? Okay, this sort of like somebody said, it looks like the crumpled foil paper that they unwrap the space needle, from, you know, from. Um, it is this building that has no structure. The, the um, particularly, it's a series of undulating kind of metal planes made out of metal plates of different colors. There's no there's no corner in the whole building, um, and you either love it or you hate it generally speaking, but what most people don't realize is that style of architecture where there is no clear, clearly defined anything. Everything is very loose. Okay. That's actually a direct result of a philosophical system, deconstructionism, which says things don't line up, things aren't straight, don't expect them to be. All right? That gets translated into all aspects of life. Deconstructionism in the last decade, 15 years or so, has fallen considerably out of favor, thank God, I mean literally. Um, 
because it doesn't take you anywhere other than to despair. And yet that's the, that has been the dominant philosophical idea. Well, one of the things that it has said, that deconstruction said, and other philosophical systems have said, is the truth about reality is not knowable. You can't really know anything. Or even that there isn't any such thing as truth available. You can see how that would affect how you do literary criticism. Well, don't look for any meaning, because there isn't any meaning. You can't find it, so stop looking. So it has to completely change itself uh, in terms of a discipline. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that, other than our basic premise is, and the apologetic premise is, that truth is knowable. That there is such a thing as objective truth, that it's not all just what we read into it. Okay? The idea that opposites cannot both be true. We got into the laws of logic. You know, for instance, particularly the law of non-contradiction, something cannot both be and do not be at the same time and in the same way. If I say Jesus was the divine Son of God and someone else says he's not, we both may have a right to say that, but we can't both be right. That is <coughs> logical in, in the technical sense of that. We talk about the fact that the thesis that God exists, a lot of our discussion, we're going to talk about the moral argument again today in more detail, but all of the arguments we've made, the cosmological argument, the fine-tuning argument, the Kalem cosmological argument, the ontological, the heliological, etc., all of those are arguments for why we believe God exists. So that's one of the basic premises. Next, we say miracles are possible. And we're going to talk about that in some length today, which is one of the reasons I'm doing this 12 point. Miracles are possible. And miracles are performed in connection with truth claims that are acts of God to confirm the truth of God about the messengers of God. The messengers of God part of this, I'm going to talk about prophecy today, particularly predictive prophecy. After making a big deal yesterday in our, in our biblical interpretation class, um, the biblical interpretation on homiletics, where I was saying prophecy, um, prophecy means doesn't necessarily mean telling the future. Prophecy means a declaration of God's word and will for the people. Well, there is such a thing as predictive prophecy that does tell the future. And so when it talks about truth of God expressed through messengers of God, that those are prophetic words. And we're going to talk about predictive prophecy as a kind of apologetics today. Um, we believe the New Testament documents are reliable. I think the second class we had was called in here was called the reliability of witnesses in which we looked at all the reasons why Scripture, the Bible, can be seen by all evidence as being better supported and more reliable than any other ancient document, or modern document for that matter. So we believe that the New Testament documents are reliable. As witnessed in the New Testament, Jesus did claim to be God. Anybody who says he didn't has not bothered to read the text. They're not paying attention, because he did. Jesus' claim to divinity was proven by a unique convergence of miracles. Not just the miracles they did, like the nature miracles, walking on water, from stilling the storm, etc., but particularly by his resurrection. Those of you who are in the homiletics class, you got that because I actually gave you my sermon text on the resurrection of Jesus. Some of you who go to our church heard that sermon, so we believe that there is strong evidence for the miracles of Jesus, and especially the big miracle, the most important one, that is his resurrection. Therefore, given that, he claimed to be God, and he demonstrated through miracles Jesus was God in human flesh. Now, all of these are just like the propositional points. There are old systems of arguments to support each of these. Many of these we've gone through. We've talked about why we believe in the existence of God and why we believe opposites can't uh, simultaneously exist and all of that. Uh, then, whoever Jesus who was God, whatever Jesus who was God affirmed as true is true. If he was God, then his word holds. And finally, um, it is true that the Bible is the word of God and whatever is opposed to any biblical truth is false. This, these 12 propositions reflect sort of the whole package of what apologetics is going for. And there are different arguments, different approaches, different systems of thought in support of each of those. All right? So, as I say, it might have been more helpful if I had done this in the first class so that you can take various kinds of discussions, apologetic discussions we've taken, we haven't plugged them into that, but you can do so now, because you've got all those study notes you're going to be spending a lot of time with, right? Mm -hmm. All right, um, let's get into the topics I want to specifically deal with today, and the first of these, um, I want to go back and look again in more depth and detail on the question of moral law as apologetics. Now, um, 
some of the stuff I was reading here that prompted me to go back and spend more time with this because I, I do believe, and I think I became more convinced of it in the last week, that the argument for the existence of God from the innate moral sensibility that all people have um, is one of the two, if not the most, it's certainly one of the two most uh, viable arguments for God in the modern world. And so that's why I think we need to spend a little more time with it. In November of 2006, there was a symposium held in La Jolla, California called the Beyond Belief Symposium. And it gathered together a bunch of uh, atheistic scientists, primarily scientists, some philosophers, but primarily scientists. And their whole focus was, how do we get beyond this silliness, they thought, of most of the world about believing in this God thing? And what can we begin to do to do away with religion? That's a quote from the symposium, to do away with religion. I said earlier um, that the new atheists are marked as much as anything else by their aggressiveness in saying they intend to try to destroy religious belief. That's their objective, because they think it is not only misguided, but counterproductive. Well, this 2006 symposium, the, the people who participated, that was a big group, but it was, the people who were there very intentionally, very consciously and specifically said that they wanted to really seriously roll up their sleeves and get started on the process of trying to destroy religion, to destroy belief in God. And in fact, an article that was written in um, the Science Magazine following that about that event, the title of the article was, In Place of God. You know, how can we find a, a way to convince societies that there is no need for God and we have something else to, to replace him with. Well now, that same group, or at least the same idea, led to another meeting in 2007. Um, now this was, it was called Beyond Belief 2, but it's interesting that in the year, having had people respond and react to the stuff that had been written and that had come out of that first symposium in 2006, the people, the, the participants approached it much more cautiously. For instance, um, instead of an article, the summary article on it being called In Place of God, afterwards, the title was God's Place in a Rational World. And I think part of it, and the people who participated there, came to realize that no matter how badly they wanted to, they were not going to drive God out of people's lives. They were not going to be successful in getting rid of that. And some of the participants at those have spoken about that experience, and one of the primary things that they have recognized as being a problem with this idea of getting rid, rid of religion is has to do with the innate sense of moral obligation that everyone who is not considered mentally ill has to some greater or lesser degree. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But I'll give you a quote from one of the participants at those events, and this came you know, after the second event. It's a man named uh, Edward Slingerland. He's from University of British Columbia. He is a, the founder of the Center for Study of Human Evolution, Cognition, and Culture. And he said this. Again, he's an atheist, but he said this. Religion is not going away. Even those of us who fancy ourselves rationalists and scientists rely on moral values, a set of distinctly unscientific beliefs. Where, for instance, does our conviction that human rights are universal come from? Humans' rights are as mysterious as the Holy Trinity. You'll notice that's not capitalized. <laughs> you, you can't do a CT scan to show where humans' rights are. You can't cut someone open and show us their human rights. It's not an empirical thing, it's just something we strongly believe in. It is a purely <coughs> metaphysical entity. Now for a completely materialistic, atheistic scientist to say moral conviction is universal is innate and it is a metaphysical thing it is quite extraordinary and yet he's not the only one that has done that the idea is almost all rational people believe in some objective morality what that means is it's not just what you think is okay virtually no one believes it is all right to walk into a house randomly and kill all the inhabitants and take their stuff Nobody thinks that's okay. Not in any culture do we think that's okay. Nobody thinks it's okay to beat and rape an innocent woman. Nobody thinks it's okay to kidnap children and torture them just for the fun of it. 
Nobody thinks that. I don't care how atheistic you are, how materialistic you are, how much anything you are. There is inherent in all people this idea that there are certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong, and that is not culturally determined. That's the old argument. Was, well, that's just what we've learned from our culture. Well, nobody really believes that anymore because it's been proven that every culture of every time in history, no matter how advanced or how primitive, have had some inherent ideas that there is right and there is wrong. An interesting sort of test case on that is uh, there's a man named Dr. Anthony Flew. He's a British philosopher from Reading, England, and he was, in the last half of the 20th century, one of the most quoted and, most, and best known um, atheistic philosophers and speakers. He wrote a number of books, he spoke frequently around the world uh, on atheism. He, uh, it's interesting, by the way, footnote, in he continued doing that up until the year 2000, and between 2000 and 2004, he started considering the existence of life and the ordered world, sort of a, a teleological question, and he came to, he finally admitted that he had come to believe that there was, there was not a naturalistic explanation for the world, that there had to be something else. He's not a Christian, he doesn't have any religious, any particular religious affiliation. But it was extraordinary that this major atheistic philosopher came out and said he's beginning to believe, at least in theism, that there has to be some force behind all of this. Okay, but anyway, in 1976, um, Anthony Flew debated a man, Dr. Thomas Warren, who is a professor of philosophy, religion, and Christian apologetics at Harding Graduate School in Tennessee. And in preparation for this four-night debate, they met for four evenings and debated publicly. As part of the set preparation for that, they were allowed to ask each other to respond to certain questions. Well, one of the questions that Dr. Warren asked Dr. Flew was, true or false, in murdering six million Jewish men, women, and children, the Nazis were guilty of a real, that is objective, moral wrong. Got that question? Either true or false, in murdering six million Jewish men, women, and children, the Nazis were guilty of a real, that means an objective, not based on personal subjective ideas, an objective moral wrong. Dr. Flew, the atheist, answered true. And in the course of discussing that in the debate, he acknowledged the existence of, quote, real objective moral wrong, which is not consistent with a materialistic atheistic idea. Consequently, the same professor who was arguing for God, uh, Dr. Warren, debated in 1978 at Dr. Wallace Matson. And again, in preparation for this debate, he had, Dr. Matson is even a much more adamant uh, atheist. He asked, again, consistent with the approach they were taking this debate, he asked the question, in murdering six million Jewish men, women, women and children, the Nazis were guilty of real or objective moral wrong, true or false? And the atheist, Dr. Matson, said true. In fact, in the course of discussing that in the debate, the atheist, Dr. Madsen, went further. He said, and I'm quoting him here, if you had been a soldier during World War II and the Nazis had captured you and had given you the choice of either joining them in their efforts to exterminate the Jews or being murdered yourself, you would have had the objective moral obligation to die rather than to join them in the murder of Jewish men, women, and children. Now, all of that just demonstrates the fact that everyone, no matter what philosophical, atheistic, theistic, whatever background they come from, virtually everyone that we don't consider mentally ill, does have a sense that there is such a thing as a moral right and a moral wrong. Another atheistic philosopher, Michael Ruse, an author, he wrote this in his book, Darwinism Defended. He said, the man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says that two plus two equals five. And he went on to say, I'm sorry, uh, the philosophers Francis Beckwith and Gregory Kukul wrote this, those who deny obvious uh, moral rules, who say that murder and rape are morally benign, that cruelty is not a vice, and that cowardice is a virtue, do not merely have a different moral point of view, they have something wrong with them. <laughs> now, where does that come from? This is the whole thing that Lewis sort of argues. But in reading a lot of this stuff, I, I thought, okay, we get to spend some more time with this. The moral argument, this is a slightly different one I gave you before, but they're, they're all valid. The first premise, if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. I'm going to unwrap that a little bit. Second premise, objective moral values do exist. That's what I was just telling you, you know. 
Even the people who don't believe there's any God or anything else, they agree that there is such a thing as objective moral right or wrong. Therefore, the argument goes, God exists. Now, let me give you a little more detailed version of that. First, if the moral code and or the actions of any individual or society can properly be subjects of criticism as to real moral wrong, in other words, if we can say they're wrong, but that what the Nazis did was wrong, then there must be some objective standard, that is, some higher law which transcends the provincial and transient. Provincial means local. It's just our tribe that believes this. Transient means it comes and goes. It's not permanent. There must be some higher law which transcends the provincial and transient, which is other than the particular moral code, that means just mine or ours, and which has an obligatory character which can be recognized. In other words, if we feel we have a right to say something is wrong morally, then where do we get that unless there is some universal sense that some things are right and some things are wrong? Got it? Again, we've talked about this some before. Secondly, the moral code and or actions of any individual or society can properly be the subjects of criticism as to real moral wrong. Um, virtually nobody, unless the, the real whack job atheist, virtually nobody says that you, you have no right to say somebody is immoral if they're you know, suffocating children for a fire. Therefore, there must be some objective standard, that is, some higher law which transcends the provincial and transient, which is other than the particular moral code, and which has an obli obligatory character which can be recognized. The obligatory character means you don't have a choice. You can't just say, well, I'm not going to follow the moral law, or what Lewis calls the natural law of morality. Now, again, we look at any of the examples down through history. The Nazis are always a good one. The Nazis herded 6 million Jewish people, and that was 3 million Jewish men, 2 million Jewish women, and a million Jewish children into concentration camps and killed them. There were 3 million others that were gypsies, Jehovah's Witnesses, Poles, Soviets, people with disabilities, that they also killed. The tally, we don't even know for sure, but it was somewhere around 9 million total. People always quote 6 million, that's just the Jews. Mm -hmm. Um, and we all say that was wrong. Whether you're a theist or an atheist, rational people will say what the Nazis did was wrong. It is wrong to rape a, a, a woman, to force yourself on her if you're a man. It is wrong to abuse children. It is wrong to do all of these kinds of things. And yet, how can we say if there is no objective moral standard to which we all are tuned in, whether we're conscious of it or not, how can we say that's wrong? Great. I just have a question. Um, does it come and go? I mean, abortion. Uh, now there's a group I've read about that they think it should be retro, I don't know, retroactive is the right word, to eight years old. You know, they're really not children until they're older. So they, they see nothing wrong They're with... They're really not humans, I guess. Yeah, they see nothing wrong with, like you say, just suffocating or doing away with them. Or, or children, <clears throat> abusing children. You know, there's a NAMBLA. The um, National Association of Man-Boy Love. They, they, yeah. they, they think, you know, that the age of consent should be lowered. I mean, if they had their way, then, I mean... Well, does, it, does, the, does the line waver? Uh, there, it, to some extent, it does. All right, but it's not true that the idea of there being real <coughs> right and wrong that's universally held to that never changes. That the reason why NAMLA is, in, you know, that the members don't announce themselves, and the reason why that's never happened is because society doesn't agree with that. Okay, and what's happening is you have there are people whose motivations are driven by their own perversions, their own appetites. Right. Okay, now, I'm not saying that everybody agrees in all. You know, some people will allow their sense of moral right and wrong to be overwhelmed by their own appetite. That doesn't change the fact there is a sense okay. of moral right and wrong. Make sense? Yeah. And, you know, societies will from time to time, I mean, one, you read any history of the Roman Empire and they'll tell you one of the reasons the Roman Empire fell was because their ethics got so horrible they no longer could sustain themselves as a society. You know, uh, I don't recommend 
watching the movie Caligula, but if you do, if you've ever seen it, that'll give you a pretty good idea. Um, and so, yeah, there are times in which certainly individuals, even groups of people, and from time to time societies will step over the line as far as we're concerned. See, the reason why abortion was legalized is because the courts were convinced that there was somehow a greater good that would be achieved by that. I don't think anybody says killing unborn children is a really good idea, that it's a really good thing. What they say is, we believe that that should be done, and I disagree with this, don't misunderstand me. They say that should be allowable in order to prevent a greater evil, which is on the, the, the mother. Okay. Um, so that's not a case where they're saying there's not a right and wrong. That's a case where they're saying quite the contrary. They're saying there is a right, but we believe this right is more important than this one. You know, meaning this, this goodness is more important than the issue of the child's life. And that's why that's such a debate, is because some people say, no, that's not true. The life of that unborn child should be the highest priority. But it's not a case where somebody is claiming there's no such thing as right and wrong. Okay? Is that fair? Um, I, I, I don't know still about, okay. about abortion. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the numbers are increasing. It so, is. So, I mean, and, and there seems to be no shame in it anymore. Well, the grief in that and the horror in that is that we have allowed what amounts to convenience, not, yeah. not just minor yes. convenience, right. but in some cases, you know, having a baby changes a woman's life, and if she values how she lives, if she values her lifestyle, or a poor, unmarried, you know, young woman, or whatever, I mean, it's, there, right. there are a wide range of things there. If you, if you consider that impact as being uh, an impact for a living, breathing person already, not someone in the womb, as being more important than a, and, and you notice the a funny thing about this is, early on in the abortion debates, there was a lot of talk about, well, it's just a piece of tissue. It's not really a lie. It's not, you know, da, da, da. You notice you never hear that anymore. The whole argument has changed because that didn't work. And so, but the idea is, what is the greater good? And they claim the greater good is the well-being of the mother, not just in case of where their health is, is endangered, but for their life where their livelihood, their lifestyle, their whatever it is, is in danger. But it's not that they're saying there's not good and evil, it's that they're saying they believe that's a more important good more important than the unborn child. Yes, uh, oh, Joan. No, I was just going to say, yeah, generally there's there's an overriding idea of what is the right or the ethical thing to do, but exactly how that plays out right. can depend on your point of view at the time. I mean, I. I sympathize with some of the reasons why people push abortion, but I myself wouldn't agree with abortion at all because I think there are much better solutions to the problems of unwanted children. And it's ridiculous for so many. When, when there's the so many people time, who want children. I know, and for the first time, we actually do have really good methods of birth control, you know, and, and that doesn't seem to have <clears> the abortion rate for all the time. Yeah. But um, yeah, even for for things that most of us now recognize as being a terrible wrong, like. Uh, killing of so many people by the Nazis in World War II, at that time, the people who were doing it had what they saw as uh, a moral obligation to exterminate the Jews for right. the greater good of mankind or the fatherland or whatever. Right. So uh, the people do have, I mean, the, the moral standard is always there, no matter what kind of horrible things you're doing, right. uh, you, you do it because of a higher moral standard. Right. And for the for the Nazis to uh, to effectively convince so many of the German people that that what they were doing to the Jews was okay, they had to convince them the Jews were not human. Yeah. And that they were a threat. Yeah. And by convincing them they were inhuman and that they were a threat, then it made it okay. Yeah. Now, again, the, the idea people say people who argue, well it's societal, you know, that the good and evil is dependent upon society. It's not. For instance, the most primitive tribe in the world may think it's okay to kidnap and fatten up and eat some other tribe's children. But none of them think it's okay to do that to my children. In fact, if you want to believe, if you want to understand people have a universal sense that there is a right and there is a wrong, start doing something to them. And all of a sudden, those who say, oh, there's no real moral absolutes, they'll start screaming bloody murder. You can't do that. That's wrong. Okay? And you're going to move your stuff. She's going to do it. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it is a matter that we will allow our own biases, our own prejudices, our own desires 
to uh, what G.K. Chesterton said, men uh, almost never disagree on what is right or wrong. They only will disagree on what is, you know, what they desire. Now, I, I, I'm going to make an exception in this case, even though I don't think it's the best, because that's really what I want. Ernest, you, you had your hand up? I think in American society, what started out as a legal argument of a woman's right to do with her body has now gravitated to a number of American society for right. something that's a reason. Yeah, and that's, you know, the, the, when the legal issue was presented, the arguments were not based upon whether or not it was a moral right or wrong. It was based on whether or not there, there was a legitimate legal right for a woman to make that decision for herself. And yet there was no, the, the consideration of what of good or evil, right or wrong, was not part of the, the discussion. It, that only came in later when people realized exactly what Roe versus Wade was going to mean. Right. Well, the initial concept, the initial argument was the baby is not human, the baby is just tissue. Now science has proven that, but we've gotten so known that we've overlooked that. Right. You know, that the babies are viable from right. very, very early on very in the gestation period. Yes, Grace. <clears throat> Another comment about abortion. For 23 years, I worked for a big army tri uh, medical center in Honolulu, and we frequently had, especially oriental wives of the military coming from Korea and Japan and all, for their abortions. And, and that was true of American women too, but not to that degree. And that's absolutely that birth control they were using, abortion. Yeah, well. So, but the idea is everybody has a sense of right and wrong. We may fudge the boundaries based upon what our preferences are, but nobody, nobody, again, that we don't consider pretty much mentally ill, will seriously question that there isn't that that it's okay to do to to walk into somebody's house and kill them. Um, Carol and I saw a few episodes of a TV show with Kevin Bacon that you know we the first season called The Following. Did you guys see that? Are you familiar with it? The whole premise behind that is that there's a guy who was a, had been a college professor, oh, was a college professor who um, was a serial killer. And he gets caught, and he gets jailed, and then he gets out. But the thing is, he, being very articulate, um, he makes the argument that this is very natural. You know, this is who I am. I'm expressing, you know, my creative urges, and my creative urges involve cutting people open. <laughs> Well, the, the thing about that was a whole group of people, it's called the following because a whole group of people who were themselves psychopaths or, you know, had murderous tendencies, he became their hero and they started following him. And so Kevin Bacon is the FBI agent, I think it's FBI, and he's trying to hunt the guy down. But he's got all these people who are, you know, now, there is such a, there is a mental illness called sociopathy. Which, which means you no longer have the ability to determine what is right or wrong. Your only motivation is what you desire. Okay, and that's a, a real mental illness. And this show was sort of like all of these people were like that. You know, one of these guys considered the greatest of all honors that he, he asked the guy to murder him. Please kill me, you know. Um, so yes, there is a sickness associated with that. But we're, when we're talking about those who are not mentally ill, there is always a sense that there is right and there is wrong. We may fudge the edges based upon our own desires, but there is right and wrong. So where does that come from? Okay. Um, let's talk about the fact that atheism does not provide a legitimate objective standard for morality. This can't come from atheism. Marvin, did you have? Oh, just that almost there, yeah. Uh, as long as there's no God, then we can bicker amongst ourselves what's right. right, what's wrong, or how much, or how little, or might makes is right. If I can take your house and your wife and your stuff, I'm, I'm right, because yep. I'm stronger than you. Yeah. Um, so the issue of where does this come from? Where does this sense of morality come from? Atheism not only doesn't provide it, but it inherently is contradictory to atheistic materialism. Atheism, for instance, says that humanity is nothing more than matter in motion. In fact, that we are animals. And, you know, we are like every other animal, only we're slightly more evolved. We see it's happen to be at the top of the food chain. But other than that, there is no difference between us and any other animal. And yet, when we talk about morality, moral observations or critiques or criticisms are only applicable to people. When one dog steals another dog's bone, we don't say, that's an evil dog. <laughs> 
you know, that dog is corrupt. There's a moral problem with that dog. You know, that shouldn't happen. We may say, hey, that's not fair. Give that back to him. But there's no sense that there's a moral violation going on, right? I mean, when we see a male dog having intercourse with a female dog in the street, we may say, that's a really bad idea because we don't need more puppies. But we don't say, that dog is raping that other dog. <laughs> All right? So, morality is solely and entirely applied to human beings. No one ever speaks of immoral minerals, you know, to use the inanimate world, or evil donkeys, or morally depraved monkeys, or corrupt spiders. <laughs> Despite the fact that animals in nature are, to use, I think it was Rousseau's term, red in tooth and claw. That eating one another and, you know, and doing whatever, if they're the strongest, getting away with whatever they want, we may say that, you know, oh, it's gross, but we don't say that's morally wrong. We do not apply moral evaluations to any creatures other than human beings. And we, and we see examples of that as being quite extraordinary. I watched a, a series of photographs, it wasn't a video, but it was a series of photographs recently about the, the lioness and the, and the baby baboon. Did you see that? This lioness captures this, you know, grabs this mother baboon who has a baby on her back and, you know, she bites the mother baboon and kills her. And the baby jumps down and runs over on a tree, but can't climb the tree. And so, the, and the, there's a little commentary by the, by the two naturalists who were, who were taking pictures here. They were actually videotaping and taking still. And they're thinking, oh no, that baby baboon is done for. Well, the, the lioness goes over to this baby baboon and sort of pokes it, and then picks it up in its mouth without hurting it, takes it over, sits down, and puts the baby baboon between his legs, her legs. And the baboon is sort of, you know, uh, you know, gathering up close to her and everything, and she's sort of, you know, and it's the most touching thing, right? Mm -hmm. Then these other lions come over and try to take the baby baboon away from her, and this female fights them off. Well, while she's fighting off these other two lions, the father baboon comes running down the tree and grabs the baby and goes back up. So the baby baboon gets back with his family or pack or you know whatever you call it, and but in the interim. For some unknown reason, this female lion was not only nurturing, but protecting this baby baboon after just having killed its mother. Why is that a touching story? Somebody tell me. Because that doesn't happen! <laughs> that simply does not happen. We don't expect that to happen. As much as we might not want to have watched it, the idea that that lion should have, you know, crunched that baby baboon and eaten him whole is what we expect. There is no, and there would be no moral negative assigned to that, right? The fact that it didn't happen strikes us as extraordinary. That's an example of the fact that we do not assign any moral consequence, attributes, values to anything other than human beings, not in the same way. It may gross us out, it may be something we don't want to see, etc., etc., but it's not a moral issue. Yes? Was that on YouTube? It wasn't a video, it was, it was just pictures. Oh, that's right. You and and you, can, you can, you know, look up a lion and maybe baboon and you'll probably find it. Okay? okay. Thank you. Um, now, even atheistic philosophers acknowledge that morality arose only among humans, and that humans have an innate sense of morality. It means it's built in. It's natural. It's not something that's just taught. It is innate. George Gaylord Simpson, a leading atheistic evolutionist, wrote this. Man is the result of a purposeless and materialistic process that did not have him in mind. In other words, there's no God, there's no intentionality behind man being created. But then he continues. Good and evil, right and wrong concepts, irrelevant in nature, except from the human viewpoint, become real and pressing features of the whole cosmos as viewed morally, because morals arise only in man. So nobody doubts that moral, even the most atheistic, that morality is inherent in human beings. It is innate. It is natural. We cannot get away from it unless we are mentally ill. His statement seems like the first part. The second part contradicts the first part. Well, exactly. I mean, the, point, the first part is he's making a right. statement that demonstrates his atheistic evolutionist point of view. That we are purposeless, we are materialistic, 
There was no intentionality behind this. But, but. <laughs> even given that, he then at least is able objectively to say, but we still have these moral values that exist only in human beings. So, now he would not perhaps see that as contradictory. He would see that as it's quite, quite extraordinary. You know, how is that so? Without realizing the contradiction of it. And I'm going to get to that. Carolyn? Well, in fact, um, most atheists would be really offended by your first, um, not by your first point, but, but by the assumption that if we are all just evolved matter in motion, that we can't justify our morality. They just, they get very defensive about that. Well, yeah, the, the new atheists have an effort to, de to decide that science can be the basis for morality, and their arguments are completely unconvincing. Oh, I think the ones I'm familiar with don't even need a basis. They yeah. just say, well, I am moral. Yeah. It's not, I don't need God to be moral. Um, and that's because it's built in, and they don't quite realize that. Exactly. <laughs> and yet, the fact that it's not, if, if we are, and they, they will say we are just evolved mammals. Yeah. And yet to say that, well, how is it then that we have morality? And there, there have been arguments that have been put forward which simply don't wash. For instance, one of the ones that has been most common and you will hear people say is, well, you know, we act morally because by being moral toward other people, by being kind to other people, etc., then, you know, we are, we are both ensuring the survival of, the, of the, the species, you know, because we're all killing each other, we're not going to last long. And if I'm nice to them, they'll be nice to me, so it's a matter of self-survival. But you know what? That doesn't fly for the very simple reason that it is a, a, a very common, almost normal characteristic of human beings that they will uh, accept a personal threat, even die, in order to accomplish a moral good. If morality was entirely based upon self-survival or survival of the species, then why would people on a regular basis throw themselves on hand grenades to save, save the people around them? Or, you know, Push, you know, jump in front of a truck and push somebody else out even though it means they're going to be crushed. Why do people do things like that if we believe it's entirely a matter of survival that we do good things to other people? <coughs> yeah, and there are also things that you can't do for your own survival or the survival of your own gene pool. Like if my kid really needs a heart transplant, I can't just kill your kid for the heart. Um, even though that would be better for my gene pool and my survival, exactly. there's nobody who's going to think that's okay. Some issues of goodness you know, are, are directly opposed by, um, or, or directly oppose our self-survival or survival of our species. Okay, same thing. It's a good example. So let's let's get into this a little bit more. We need to recognize that um, atheistic evolution cannot logically explain the existence of morality, other than saying, "Well, I'm moral, mm -hmm. and I don't believe that I was made by anybody else." Well, that doesn't, doesn't help. <laughs> That's called begging the question, where you're not really answering it. You're not, you're not responding to it. Um, secondly, real objective moral right or wrong cannot exist if human beings are nothing more than animals like all other animals, for the very simple reason that we have an inherent sense that morality doesn't apply to any other animals. We are different in kind, not just in degree of evolution. We are different in kind, somehow, from all other animals. And when pushed to it, I don't think people will argue that. So if atheism is correct, then we, and we have no basis for considering people anything more than animals, then we logically have no basis for moral determinations. That is, we cannot reasonably condemn rape or genocide or child abuse, abuse or predatory sexual uh, exploitation of children or anything else. If the atheistic evolutionists are right, and I use those two words together for a reason. That doesn't mean you have to believe in, you know, in young earth creationism in order for this not to hold. But if, if evolutionary atheists are correct that we are simply a slightly more evolved, then it doesn't hold together. It just simply doesn't work. Because morality kicks that whole idea in the head. We are somehow different in kind, not just in degree, from all other creatures. And yet, this idea, this last one, that if, if atheism is correct, then we have no basis on which we can say something is wrong or right. Charles Darwin said, A man who has no assured and ever-present belief in the existence of a personal God, or 
of a future existence with retribution and reward can have for his rule of life, as far as I can see, only to follow those impulses and instincts which are the strongest or which seem to him the best ones. Survival of the fittest. Jean-Paul Sartre said, I can't see his name, sorry, everything is indeed permitted if God does not exist. In other words, both of those are saying, without God, the atheistic alternative does not give us a foundation or premise from which we can decide that there is such thing as right and wrong. If we are only animals, then we might as well you know, act like it. Inoculate in the streets, no. kill and eat, whatever, you know, whatever living things we can find, even if there are other people, etc., etc., etc. We have no basis for not acting like animals unless we are something more than that and made in the image of something more than that. So we need to recognize that atheism will take us in a direction that we're not prepared to deal with. Now, there haven't been a lot, but there have been a few atheists who actually have accepted and embraced this idea that there is no moral right or wrong as the natural logical consequence of their atheistic beliefs. Richard Dawkins, who if you ask him, he probably would insist there was a right or wrong, he said this. Dawkins is known for, one of his most famous things, is uh, identifying genes as the basis of evolution. Genetic material, the genetic uh, proliferation of genetic material is the thing that has led to evolution. That's his big you know, evolutionary gene theory. He said, life has no higher purpose than to perpetuate the survival of DNA. So long as DNA gets passed on, it does not matter who or what gets hurt in the process. Genes don't care about suffering because they don't care about anything. DNA neither cares nor knows. DNA just is, and we dance to the music. This universe that we observe has precisely the properties we expect. If there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Another atheistic biologist, evolutionary biologist, William Provine, said, No inherent moral or ethical laws exist, nor are there absolute guiding principles for human society. The universe cares nothing for us. We have no ultimate meaning in life. <laughs> These ideas, when pushed to their logical conclusion, result in the atrocities that we have found in history. You know, the atheistic efforts, the French Revolution, and the, you know, the busyness of the guillotine, and the Soviet gulags, and genocides in various parts of the world, and Nazism, etc., etc., etc. This is what happens when those who are atheistic really do embrace the logical consequences with regard to morality of where their, their belief system will take them. There's no question about that. Um, now, so... Atheism is at best contradictory because it can't explain a fundamental. It acknowledges there is a fundamental morality in all people, but it can't explain where it comes from. So it's inher inherently contradictory, or else it becomes hideous. Um, and one example: a man named Eric Pianka. He is an evolutionary ecologist. He, in 2006, was recognized. He lives in Beaumont, Texas. He was recognized as the Distinguished Texas Scientist of the Year. And in his acceptance speech for that, he stated, we are no better than bacteria. <laughs> and he followed up by saying he had a real concern, since he's an evolutionary ecologist, an atheistic evolutionary ecologist, he was concerned about how human population or overpopulation is destroying the earth. He went on to say that the earth as we know it will not survive without drastic measures. And in fact, he, his prediction as an expert in this field was that we needed to reduce the human population on Earth by 90%. <laughs> and he recommended we do so by using airborne Ebola, because it kills in a matter of a few days instead of years. He proposed wow. that. He goes, wow. Are you sure? <laughs> Shouldn't we just eat the babies of the floor? <laughs> In fact, a, a reasonable proposal yes, the one. Um, was, oh, the, the I Gulliver, can't remember Gulliver's that. Travels guy. Who wrote Gulliver's Travels? Jonathan Swift. Jonathan Swift. Jonathan Swift wrote a parody called A Reasonable Proposal in which he recommended that the way to deal with the poor 
in Britain, especially in London in his day, was to start eating their babies. Yeah. Provide protein, yeah, you go. get rid of the food problem, reduce the population, everything makes Everybody's sense. Everybody's happy. <laughs> <laughs> now, if somebody has observed that, that Bianca's, uh, Bianca's recommendation that we use airborne Ebola to kill 90% of the population, at least 90% of them have a problem with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and who decides? Right? Who decides? Who goes, who stays? Right? Lottery. What kind of panel do you put together for that? I need Lottery. a gas mask. <laughs> yeah, I need a gas mask. Um, so the, the idea is that we cannot accept, as atheism would insist, that there is not moral good and evil. You hear a story like that and you go, what the crap is wrong with that guy? <laughs> Why? Why do you say that? Why does everybody say that? Because there is something wrong with him. Anybody who would propose that we use airborne Ebola to kill 90% of the population of, of the earth in order to protect the earth has got something wrong with him. Mm. And, if, and if the purpose of the universe is DNA, wouldn't, wouldn't cancer be the most evolved of all things, not humans? I mean, it re replicates way better than we do. Yeah. Um, or bunnies. Bunnies replicate better than we do. Bunnies rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> so you get the idea that this is why, I, and I believe almost everybody can, you know, you tell that story about the atheist evolutionary ecologist, you know, Eric Bianchi. Suggesting that we use airborne Ebola to kill 90% of the population of the Earth because, for the sake of the planet, and everybody's going to go, what? And you go, <laughs> now why do you say that? Because if we're just animals, then if there's no real moral right or wrong that we all accept, then that's the natural conclusion. And, or then what the Nazis did was the natural conclusion, or etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If we do accept that there are things that are inherently right or wrong, that are innately perceived as right or wrong, then where does that understanding in us come from? If not from some source that is absolutely good and makes us aware of an absolute evil. We get that from somewhere. That is the argument for the existence of a good God, good and moral God. Yes, Mike? What would you say to, a, to an atheist that said that the behavior is genetic and that the genetic behavior of, say, throwing yourself on a grenade, preserves the gene pool to, uh, that you're in to go forward? I'd say that's not rational, uh, because there is no way in which we can, if it is an inherent drive for survival, then the idea that I would make an instantaneous decision to destroy my DNA, to quote Dawkins, or to destroy myself, but again, it's not, if you sit down and you think about it, and you say, well, okay, I am going to, I am going to make a decision to sacrifice myself. But the fact that people do it instantaneously is not a survival instinct. There is something inherent in them that makes an instantaneous decision that saving them is worth me dying. And it's not, it's not a reasoned decision. That argument suggests that there is a reasoned uh, motivation for somebody to sacrifice themselves for the greater good. It simply isn't. You know, that doesn't wash. And as Joan said, then there are all these other examples where, you know, for if there's no inherent morality, if, if my child has already, say my child has already proven that they are, you know, a prodigy in playing the piano, they have an IQ of 197, the fourth highest IQ ever recorded, and <laughs> that's from the TV show, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they've already, you know, pursued new, you know, higher levels of, of advanced math and have been given a scholarship to MIT and they're only 11 and it's et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> and my child has our condition, is it acceptable for me to kidnap and murder and take the heart from a child that's suffering from hyperencephalitis, who is paralyzed, who is, is that okay? Would it be? Almost nobody would say yes. It's never right to take somebody else's child and kill them in order to save your child, no matter what your child's IQ or potential is, or what their circumstance was. That's why a reasonable proposal, the Jonathan Swift thing, is it's such an extraordinary piece of literature as a parody, because it, it plays on exactly that. This is a perfectly reasonable thing, and yet nobody accepts that that's an okay thing to do.
The moral thing is that we all became donors. Well, yeah, I mean, that, but you're getting into the, there's good and there's evil. Yes, my, my question back to him who was worrying about the earth is why care? Or who cares yeah. about the earth? Exactly. And that, that, that observation actually was made is you say there's no such thing as right or wrong, there's just survival. Well, why is that more important? Then why, why are you saying that it's a higher good for the earth to survive than for 90% of the people to survive? Don't you? You just, you're drawing your moral line in a, in a different and very crazy place. <laughs> <laughs> all right? And we all laugh at that because we know it's a crazy place. Apparently, he's the only one that didn't. Not so crazy as long as you're in the 10%. Well, yes. Yeah. Because <laughs> I get the other 90% stuff. <laughs> That's what's on. Okay. Look for it. You know, the, the last one on the earth, but maybe, but he's just going to die, and that's yeah. Well, let's let's take a break. One of the things that I hope you will notice in a, a, a lot of our conversations, actually, in apologetics, is the extent to which. This really does just simply make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Unless somebody has a very skewed idea. When I crack these jokes like say, crazy, the reason that's funny is because it's obvious that that's crazy. And, and the reason I think that like the, the issue of the moral law being inherent in all people, the reason that I think is one of the, the most effective apologetic approaches with people today is that if you present it to them in a reasonable way, any reasonable person would say, well, yeah. Um, and yet, so often it's not presented in a reasonable way. Next week we will talk about the new atheists, and one of the things they're guilty of is they do not present things in a reasonable way. For instance, Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, from time to time, he's a, he's a scientist, uh, evolutionary geneticist. And from time to time, he tries to sally into philosophy, and he's a really crappy philosopher. <laughs> In fact, real philosophers go, dick, 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 stick with your gene theory. <laughs> because you really don't get it when it comes to philosophy. He does not think well. And so when he starts trying to get philosophically involved in making these arguments, people go, you're not making any sense at all. At least the people who are not just enamored of the very idea. Again, one of the things, and... Atheism in Great Britain, and a number of these guys are British. I mean, there are several Americans too, but uh, Christopher Hitchens, who died in 2011, and Richard Dawkins, who's still alive. <laughs> Lord, we'll take him home someday. He may not be the home he wants. Uh, but the, in Britain, this, you know, Great Britain and most of Western Europe is considered a post Christian society. And in Great Britain, the fastest growing religious affiliation in Britain is atheist faster than Islam or anything else. Uh, there is a revival of Christianity, by the way. It's not all bad news. But is atheism, and partly because of the influence of people like Dawkins and Ding and Sam Harris and, and Christopher Hitchens. But um, when you actually, unless you're just enamored by the whole idea, or you really, you know, for many people, I think it's, oh, they give me the freedom to do whatever I want. You know. Um, for the people who actually are thoughtful and are really concerned about what is true and not just what is in vogue, or what sounds cool at the moment, their thinking is not very good. And we'll talk about that next week. And so I just say that because as we talk about these things, be aware of the fact, and this is one of the best ways for you to understand it and be able to, you know, to, do, to speak apologetically yourself, is to realize that most of this is just good sense. Like the watchmaker analogy, you know, it makes sense. And the ones that are mo most obviously simply make sense are the ones that I think are most effective in communicating with you. Okay? Let's talk about miracles as an apologetic. The existence of miracles um, in, is a very strong apologetic approach. Christianity, first we have to recognize, is a supernatural religion, which is why the naturalistic atheistic philosophers, you know, don't, will not get it, because it is a supernatural religion. It is above the natural world. It doesn't mean it, it is contrary to, but it is greater than, supernatural, above natural. That's what the word super means. Um, miracles are essential to the very nature of Christianity. Without miracles, there is no Orthodox Christianity. And, you know, we can talk about miracles like the virgin birth or walking on water or raising Lazarus or feeding the 5,000. Those were all very important because they testified to the uniqueness and miraculous abilities of Jesus. 
But the one miracle that really makes a difference is the resurrection. Without it, we don't got nothing. Without the resurrection, without the miracle of someone actually dying and being raised from the dead, there is no Christianity. Not in any orthodox, historic sense of Christianity. There may be a, you know, some lay moral system um, effort, an effort at a moral system, but um, there is no real Christianity. Now, so what is a miracle? I'm giving you my definition of a miracle. Those of you who are in philosophical theology will remember, I did not like the other <laughs> definitions of miracles that were available, and so I'll give you mine. Now, for instance, Wayne Grudem, in his book on, on systematic theology, um, it was systematic theology, not philosophical theology, um, Grudem said that it is an extraordinary event that really gains attention, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, no, a volcano is that, you know. Um, and he insisted that it was not a violation of the natural order, and I think it is a violation of the natural order. But his problem with it being a violation of the natural order is that that suggested that there was, you know, that um, God wasn't responsible for the natural order, and I don't think that's necessary. Anyway, my definition of miracle. An event or occurrence in which God acts or allows his servants to act with intentionality, there are no accidental miracles, in other words, with intentionality in a way not limited by the usual boundaries of natural law which he has put in place. God created the natural law. There's no question about that. Things work under a system that God put in place. If you plant tomatoes, tomatoes will come up. If you planted tomatoes and crabgrass always came up, you'd starve to death, or whatever the crop is. God created natural law for our protection, for our benefit. A miracle is when God chooses to supersede that natural law for his purposes. It doesn't happen accidentally, but it is a superseding of the natural law. And people like Grudem and others who have a problem with saying that, I don't quite get. God made the natural law, and God can choose to step over it when he wants to. It's as simple as that in my mind. Now, so how is it that miracles are a testimony of apologetic truth. If the New Testament documents are true and reliable, as we have argued that they are, go back to the class on reliability of the witnesses, where we talked about how extraordinarily verified the, the text is and how reliable we believe it is. If the New Testament documents are true and reliable, then their report of miracles must be true and reliable. Someone like Rudolf Bultmann, who looks at the New Testament and says, I like it all except the supernatural parts. I like it all except the miracles. And so therefore we have to demythologize scripture. We have to take out all of the non-scientifically verifiable stuff. And then we're good. He has nothing left. There is nothing of any consequence left. So, we believe, and we have arguments, I'm not going to go back into all of those arguments again, we believe that the New Testament is reliable, that we can trust it as much as we can trust anything else in the world, and if that's true, then miracles are part of that. Carolyn? I was just going to kind of reiterate what you said, because history also can't be verified, so you oh, yeah. wouldn't like any of the New Testament if it had to be verified, because you can't verify history, it's not replicable. Well, that's just like... You'll know what I mean. That's just like the logical positivists. Exactly. The logical positivists. <laughs> this was a movement, it was called the Vienna Circle in the 19th century, early 20th century. And they advocated what was called the verification principle. What that meant was, and these were, you know, this was when science was taking over the world. The verification principle said that nothing can be considered true that cannot be empirically demonstrated. That is, by scientific experimentation. If you cannot demonstrate it by scientific experimentation, then it is not to be considered true. They were called the logical positivists, or the Vienna Circle. The logical positivists had one basic problem. The verification principle is not able to be verified. <laughs> the verification principle is self-defeating because it cannot be empirically verified nor can anything else that really matters. Mm -hmm. So this idea, and, and a lot of the, as you read the notes, and we'll talk about next week, that the science 
orientation, there's a strong scientific orientation by the new atheists that, you know, they, they want to boil everything down to a scientific hypothesis or scientific proposition. And they say, they, for instance, say belief in God is a scientific hypothesis, that, hypothesis which they claim to be able to disprove. Well, not everything is a scientific issue. That's, that boils down to our problem of thinking that science is, is somehow divine, or uniquely divine. Stan. Uh, your definition of miracle, is it exclusive to human beings? In what way do you mean exclusive to human beings? Exclusive. Um, I mean, can, can a miracle occur in nature? No, not by this definition. Okay. Um, Why not? Well, God. Well, I, I, I'm I'm hard pressed. The wind and the sea obeyed him. That's isn't that a natural? Well, it's it, the natural. In fact, there's a whole category of miracles that Jesus did called natural. The natural miracles or the nature miracles. Stilling the storm, walking on water, multiplying the you know the bread and fishes. So yes, I mean that can they can be applied to things things of nature, but only to in a way and to the extent that they are applicable to human existence. Now, it may be, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it, doesn't make a noise, okay? We always say, if a tree falls in the forest, does anybody care? No. Um, it's a joke. I like forests. I like forests. Um, the idea is, yes, it's possible that God, for his own good pleasure, is doing miraculous things in forests where there are no people to witness it or benefit from it. That's possible. But, we wouldn't know, and so to the extent that we have any awareness of it, then miracles may be done on natural objects, but they are for the benefit or the experience or the, you know, of, of human beings. Make sense? Yeah. I can't think of any examples where there would be a natural, something we would call a miracle that would occur in the natural world, unless God is just doing it without us being either aware or involved, human beings meaning, um, without it just simply being something God's doing for his own pleasure. I don't know. That's possible. Your story of the lioness and the big bedroom, is that not, in a way, a, a miracle? Because that uh, is certainly contrary to normal behavior. And, uh, it's, is, con it's contrary to normal behavior, but it's not contrary to natural law. In that regard, it is not a miracle. It's, you know, animals can act in strange ways, yeah. and that was acting in a strange way, without it being a violation. Now, if the if the baby baboon had levitated to the top of the tree to get away from the, from the plane, then that would have been a miracle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there would have been people there to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess when it comes to miracle too, is there a sense of discernment of what is a miracle? Because we've got all these creatures out there doing their voodoo or the hocus pocus stuff. And, you know, obviously, they're frauds in a sense, but there are true miracles that do occur. Right, and there is in this definition, there is no presence of a necessary observance. Yeah. Okay, in other words, I'm not saying something that appears to be contrary to natural law. I'm saying something that is contrary to natural law. That's the definition of miracle. Yeah. Granted, there are, you know, there are people who are misled by what they think was miraculous, you know, and, and for various mischievous reasons. But that's not within this definition. I'm not, this is not dependent upon observation. To that extent, now, every miracle that we're aware of, somebody either benefited from it or were there to perceive it, like the miracles of Jesus. As I say, it's very possible God might do miraculous things in the forest with nobody available to see it, or under the sea or somewhere else where we couldn't experience it, for his own pleasure. That's fine. But it would. it's not dependent upon somebody seeing it as contrary to the natural order. It is contrary to the natural order. Does that make sense? So it's, it, if somebody's fooled by it, it's not a miracle, yeah. no matter what they thought. Okay. So perception is not a criterion here. Okay, last question. Okay. And I'll shut up. Mm -hmm. um, science and wonders, where do they fit in this camp in relation to miracle? When you, I understand science. What do you mean by wonders? Signs and wonders. Oh, signs and wonders. Yes. Signs and wonders, I thought you said science and wonders. No, it's not. It's signs okay, and wonders, yeah, to the extent that they are miraculous events, you know, healings, um, things of that sort, then yes, they are miracles. Absolutely. Um, so no question about that. Now, there are some kinds of signs which I think are 
extraordinary manifestation of the Holy Spirit that may not necessarily be miracles. I mean, the gift of teaching, the gift of hospitality, you know, those are manifestations of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but there is no, there is no setting aside of the usual boundaries of the natural law involved in that. If somebody, you know, if somebody is blind and they're made to see, that is, so, you know, because somebody has a gift of healing, then that is a setting aside of the natural law. There is no natural explanation for how they can see. So there are sense, a sense in which signs being manifestations of the Holy Spirit may or may not be miraculous in terms of superseding the natural order of things. Yes, uh, you're thinking, Barbara, but you had your hand up. No, I didn't. Oh, <laughs> Ernest. With respect to the third book, wouldn't this apply to a certain extent to the Old Testament as well? Yes, it would, but I... I, I, mean, I realize the documents are different. Principle. It is. The principle would be the same. In fact, it's probably ill-advised of me to have said the New Testament. I should have said if the scriptural documents are true and reliable, as we argue that they are. Because there are a lot of miracles in the Old Testament, too. You know, the, verified. Yeah. So, again, God can do anything He wants. And when He does something that is outside the bounds of what we understand and accept to be the natural law, or perhaps I should say, when he's, he does something that is outside the bounds of the natural law, whether we understand that or not, then it is a miracle. It is possible, and this may be some of what you're getting at, Stan, it is possible that there are things that we just haven't figured out yet that are not really outside natural law, but that, and so therefore would not be necessarily miraculous, but we may, you know, we may not understand the difference yet. It's true that many of the things we take for granted in science today would have been considered magic thousand years ago. Joan? Yeah, but if God uses that to get our attention, to tell us something, to teach us something, to call attention to himself, it doesn't really matter if someday it can be explained by science or not, because right. at that time he was using it to, to teach us something about himself or to call attention to something. And Correct. Well, and that's, that, that's, that's perfectly valid that God uses things, whether miraculous or not, to call us, but that doesn't affect the definition of miracle. You know, uh, the extraordinary preaching gift that Jesus had. You know, in one way you could say that that was an extraordinary, that was miraculous because he was God himself. Well, what about the extraordinary preaching ability of uh, Billy Graham? Is that a miracle? Or is it, is it a giftedness of the Holy Spirit which he used his natural willingness and ability? Or, you know, but, so, yeah, God speaks to us, God reaches out to us. But a miracle means what we understand or what is, the natural order of things, is set aside. All right now, why is that is that the case? Because we have testimony throughout all of Scripture, and our history correction is correct is right. Not just the New Testament, but all of Old Testament of miraculous things happening. You know, of the Red Sea rolling being rolled back, of the Jordan River being rolled back, of um, you know, and there are a number of instances where water gets rolled back, where Elijah and Elisha are together right before Elijah is taken up into heaven, and he takes off his cloak and strikes the water, and it parts, and they walk across the river. You know, or the number of times when people are raised from the dead. You know, those are our miraculous events because they set the, the natural order of things is set aside. Well, you take all that out and you have no more Bible. Not in any sense of what we understand it to be. And we believe that those things are, that the scripture is reliable. We have a legitimate case for arguing that it is reliable and true to the extent that anything is reliable and true. And so, therefore, we believe that these miracles are an argument in favor of them. Now, it, it can be argued that miracles are not only possible, which is sort of what we've been talking about so far, but in fact that they are probable, given the existence and nature of God. What do we mean by that? If God is an all-powerful God, He can do anything. If He is an omnibenevolent God, then He desires to do miraculous things. It is in His nature to do miraculous things for the benefit of His creatures end of his world. Jesus performed miracles for two reasons. One, to demonstrate his power and that he was not just another teacher. And secondly, especially, he did so out of compassion for the needs of the people. Miracles were done because the nature of Jesus, the nature of God, is to have compassion. So it is not only possible, but given what we believe about the nature of God, it is probable that miracles occur. And we have the experience of miracles occurring down through human history. How many of you have experienced something you really believe was a miracle in the sense that the natural order of things were set aside? Okay? 
a, he a miraculous healing, an extraordinary event, I don't know how that car missed me, you know, whatever it was, the idea that in some way, completely inexplicable by any natural sense, God has acted. My experience has been in any Christian group of this kind, if you ask who had personally experienced a miracle, you'll get between a third and a half of people say they have. In that regard, we come back to the argument from religious experience, and that is if that many people claim a personal experience with a miraculous, that is setting aside of the natural order and a fulfilling of God's desire and will, then it's a pretty weak argument to say they're all deluded, misguided, mentally ill, they all have tumors, there's something wrong with them. There is too much weight of testimony. You know? And so for that reason, similarly, the existence of miracles as a common human experience is testified to. Right? All those reasons we believe that miracles, and you know, when it boils down to it, what does it mean if miracles, in the sense of God setting aside the natural order of things to accomplish his will in some way, what is the natural conclusion if we accept that those miracles happen? There's a God. If the definition of miracle is that God is doing it, and we argue that it not only is possible but probable that those miracles exist, and it is a predominant experience in human, the human race, de facto, someone is doing it, and that's someone we define as God. So that's why miracles are really an apologetic. Understand? Any questions about that? Yes, Verna. Yes. Um, the source of miracles that the uh, Egyptians did for most of the time to mm -hmm. what, what about the miracles that they performed? Well, by definition, when we say miracle, we are talking about an act of God. There are, there is magic, and there are tricks. The devil can do some extraordinary things, and people on his side might call them miracles. We don't. So when we say that God does miracles, that He sets aside the natural order with intentionality in order to cause something to happen, to make a point, to give witness, whatever. Um, that is not to exclude the fact that there may be other forces in the world that also have the power to do things that appear to be in violation of the natural order. And we believe God will only allow that to go so far. And that, in fact, God will not allow that to accomplish its ultimate nefarious goals. You know, the, the magicians of the Pharaoh were able to match Moses, trick for trick, up to only a certain point. And beyond that, Moses was able to do things that they couldn't do. Right? There's some great magicians out there. Magicians out there. I don't know how an elephant disappears. I don't know how a locomotive disappears. But David Copperfield and those guys do it, right? Or it looks like they do it. So it's possible that, to use that example, that the Egyptian um, magicians under Pharaoh that they simply were had very good sleight of hand, like making the elephant disappear. Or it's possible that they were working under the power of spiritual beings that were not God, and were not on God's side, because the angels do have powers as well, and demons are fallen angels. Um, but there's a limit. God will not allow them to equal him in terms of his ability to do miraculous things. Is that fair? Somebody up here? Uh, I think you answered it. I was just going to say, are there documented miracles by other religions, say, the Muslim and the Buddhist. And well, yes. But I think um, you kind of said that fallen angels and other yeah. beings can certainly help them as well. Certainly Islam and Judaism have that. Um, some of the Eastern religions, because of their belief system, miracles, you know, they don't accept them, that there is a natural order of things. Everything's kind of up in the air, and so they would not have the same definitions. Okay, we can get into that. All right, I want to spend the next little bit we have talking about predictive prophecy as apologetics. As we talked about yesterday, for those of you who weren't in that class, the word prophecy does not mean, just the word prophecy does not mean telling something that hasn't happened yet. Prophecy means to speak God's word. And it was, in scripture, there's, there is more uh, foretelling than it, there is foretelling, to use the, usual, the commonly used word. Foretelling means 
to say, thus saith the Lord, and it has to do with what God is saying, you need to straighten up, or whatever. That is prophecy. It is speaking God's word to the people. But there is a particular kind of prophecy, which is called predictive prophecy, or foretelling, where you are, you know, God miraculously enables someone to be able to describe events that have not yet happened. Now, there are an estimated 1,817, I say estimated because people differ on whether or not something really is a predictive prophecy or not. But 1,817 predictive prophecies are estimated by the Encyclopedia Bible of Prophecy. Many of those having been written hundreds of years before the events that fulfilled them. For example, the book of Isaiah, which you, you know, some people only get exposed to the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, in at Christmas time, because it is full of messianic prophecies about how, you know, he will be born in Bethlehem, and he will be born of a virgin, and on and on and on, and that he will suffer, you know, he, by his stripes we are healed, and, and etc. Well, Isaiah wrote that 700 years before Jesus. And so, we know that's when it was written. Those, those docu that document was available and being read bef by the Jewish people a long time before Jesus came along. Even the most liberal of scholars who say it was not written until later, nobody thinks it was written as late as the first century AD. Nobody. So... How do you explain the fact that there are all these things that seem to very specifically line up with what we find as the story in the New Testament? Now, liberal scholars or liberal skeptics would say, oh, well, the things that, that they're describing in the New Testament, they didn't really happen. They just made that up in order to fit. Well, people who are willing to make that argument are minuscule. And that goes back to the reliability of Scripture, especially in the New Testament. You know, that it wasn't written later, that it wasn't, you know, and, and to me, the, the whole thing about, oh, well, they were just trying to sell their religious belief. There was no upside to being a Christian in the first century. <laughs> the idea that they were writing this as a document of propaganda makes no sense, okay, unless they really believed the things they were writing were true. So, first, there are a huge number of predictive prophe prophecies in the Bible. If, again, the New Testament documents, and I could say the whole of Scripture, but here we're talking about the, uh, the, the fulfilled if they are true and reliable in their reports are fulfilled, should be any in their predictive prophecy. Um, if, if the documents are reliable, then their reports of those prophecies being fulfilled are reliable. It's a given. We don't pick and choose. This part we believe is true, this part we don't. We are not the Jesus Seminar. <laughs> the, you know the Jesus Seminar. We've talked about that a lot in other classes. The Jesus Seminar is a, a group of pseudo-scholars who got together for many years, and they would go through the sayings of Jesus and the events of the Gospels and decide what did they think almost certainly did happen, might have likely happened, might have happened, almost certainly didn't happen or didn't happen. And they voted using colored stones. And they ended up discounting 85% of what the Gospels tell us about Jesus. They're not scholars. They're people who have their own agenda. Um, so, we don't do that. We don't buy that. And so if we believe the New Testament is true in total, then we believe that what it says about the fulfilling of those prophecies is true. If fulfilled predictive prophecy exists, which we believe it does, then it is a strong argument for the existence of an omniscient God. Why do we say omniscient God? Because God is the one who gave those messages, and He is omniscient or all-knowing because He let them, those writers know hundreds of years before it actually happened, what was going to happen? That's a sign of being omniscient. Now, we've talked about a biblical interpretation. I used the example just this week that I don't think when Isaiah wrote all those things about the coming Messiah, I don't think he knew exactly. You know, God had not given him a photo of Jesus and a bio and said, okay, now write this stuff about him. He, I'm sure that the prophets of the Old Testament did not know exactly how all of this stuff was going to play out. But they were given these messages, and then later on, the people who experienced it said, wow, that's exactly what Isaiah or Jeremiah or whoever said. So we believe that the existence of fulfilled, predictive prophecies is a very powerful, strong argument for the existence of an omniscient God. Now, we need to recognize that within Scripture, there are two broad categories of biblical prophecy, generally speaking. There is messianic and non-messianic. The reason we break it up that way is that that so many of the prophecies 
uh, of the Old Testament have to do with the coming Messiah, the promised one who would come to fulfill the promise that it made first to Abraham and all the way down through then to David. And so there are prophecies about the coming of the Messiah um, that are very powerful. In fact, um, one scholar lists 191 prophecies specifically concerned with the anticipated Jewish Messiah and Savior. 191. And of those, um, where's my number? Something like 100 of them have been fulfilled. And the others mostly have to do with uh, what we now believe is the second coming of the Messiah. That, that Jesus is not going to come the same way the second time that he did the first time. And so we expect that there still will be fulfillment. But more than half of those 191 messianic prophecies have to, we already can look at and say those have been fulfilled. Now, they have to do with everything from, uh, the messianic prophecies have everything to do with the fulfillment of uh, predictions in Isaiah about the virgin birth, about uh, the fact he's going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea, uh, that it's going to be during the, that there are going to be wise men come and visit him. Um, and on and on and on. All of these various bits and pieces of things that when you put them all together, they end up being an extraordinary portrait of the one whom we know as Jesus. And we know they were written a long time before he got there. And all of the people, the Jewish people who were alive during the time of Jesus and immediately after Jesus, who knew him and knew the circumstances of his birth and his life and his sacrifice, they were Jewish people who had access to those scriptures, and they go, Isaiah said this, look at that. Jeremiah said this, look at that. Micah said this, look at that. They were there for it. And we have the record of that in scripture. Um, prophecies about the Messiah's ancestry, about the coming of John the Baptist as the forerunner and herald, about the purpose and work of the Messiah. Particularly having to do with the suffering and death of the Messiah, we are told in the Old Testament he was to be rejected, a man of sorrow, living a life of suffering, despised by others, he would carry our sorrows, be smitten and afflicted by God, be pierced for our transgressions, wounded for our sins, suffer like a lamb without speaking, die with the wicked, be sinless, and pray for others. All of those kinds of examples we have as being fulfilled in the life of Jesus. The the weight of all of that, down to great details, like his hands and feet will be pierced, his side will be pierced, they will cast lots for his garments, um, details of the, of the resurrection and of the ascension, all written hundreds of years before the life and death of Jesus. Okay? So an extraordinary weight of evidence in terms of the messianic prophecies. By the way, Blaise Pascal, if you don't know Blaise Pascal, you need to get to know him. Uh, one of the most brilliant of Christians. He died in his 30s. And yet, there are at least four major theorems or, or uh, principles named after him. In, in, he was a physical scientist, a philosopher, a theologian, um, and quite extraordinary. And to him, the fulfillment of prophecy was one of the strongest testimonies to the truth of Jesus. Uh, he, he saw... In, in, in fact, he has sort of three lines. One is evidential. He saw the evidence you know, demonstrated by the life of Jesus and, and the existence of God. The One was his Pascal's Wager, the logic of that. If you know Pascal's Wager, that is uh, Pascal who, who created the laws of probability as a mathematician. Uh, he said, if you believe in God and he's real, then you gain eternal life. If he's not real, you at least have a life worth living. If you decide against God and he's real, you suffer eternal damnation. And if he's not real, you have a life that doesn't mean anything. In other words, if you believe in God and follow him, you can't lose. If you reject God, you can't win. That's Pascal's wager. And that's been a very influential sort of logical argument. <coughs> not for the existence of God, but the, for the fact that either way you go, it's better to be on his side than not. And the third besides the evidential side that Pascal wrote about and Pascal's wager, the logic and probabilities, um, he also dealt a great deal with the fulfillment of predictive prophecy. In addition to the messianic prophecies, we have non-messianic prophecies, which can be quite extraordinary. The book of Daniel has a lot of this stuff. Daniel's predictions about the coming kingdoms that were represented by the various parts of the giant idol, you know, the golden head and the silver chest and the, down to the feet of clay. 
Um, the fact that Cyrus, a king of Persia, is named in the book of Daniel, even though he didn't arrive for a long time after that. It was written long before he was born, and yet he is, he is named in the book of Daniel as Cyrus, king of Persia. Um, pretty extraordinary. And again, all of these things, people, people, skeptics have turned themselves inside out to try to explain this stuff. But there is more sensible support for defending it than not. The idea that the Jews would return to the Promised Land more than once, the idea that the Golden Gate of the city of Jerusalem would be sealed, the destruction of the city of Tyre, the doom of the nation of Edom, which by the way was the capital Petra, was the city of Edom. You know? People still say the city of Petra was so extraordinary and so def easily defended. What happened? Well, the prediction is in the Old Testament that the nation of Edom, and their capital was in Petra, would fall. Um, and not, like a lot of the others, would not rise again. The flourishing of the Palestinian desert, which has only happened since the late 1940s with, with the Israeli uh, efforts to try to plant the desert, irrigate it, it's in perfect fulfillment of the descriptions that are in Scripture about what will happen in the desert of Palestine. Um, all of that adds up to say this is a strong argument. Fulfilled predictive prophecies, prophecy is a strong argument. And, and an important conclusion here, even one real case of fulfilled prophecy, I just told you that they counted 18 to 1900 Old Testament prophecies, many of which were fulfilled in New Testament times or since, right? not all, but many. If even one of those really happened, then the skeptics have a problem. They don't all have to be fulfilled. If even one of those is fulfilled accurately, then that demonstrates a supernatural occurrence. Understand? To make the case against prophecy, predictive prophecy being fulfilled, you would have to be able to give a natural explanation for every fulfilled example of predictive prophecy. And they can't do that. And for the ones that we don't, that aren't fulfilled, or we don't see how they were fulfilled, I think the answer is, well, we don't know yet. <laughs> they didn't know for 700 years after, after Isaiah wrote his book, what's this about Bethlehem? What's this about a virgin giving birth? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we may just not have seen it yet. But if even one of those examples is verifiable, and so, therefore supernatural, then there's a problem for the skeptics. And it is therefore a legitimate uh, apologetic approach. Stan? Uh, when it comes to interpretation of prophecy, we look back at some writers like John, John Nelson Darby, and dispensationalism, and creation of the rapture, which never existed prior to his right. time. Well, what's your thoughts on that? Well, some people have gotten it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, there has been a lot of people who are so fascinated by this prophetic stuff. Yesterday we got into discussion about the blood moons and how, you know, and, and one person in our class was saying that she knows some people who are so committed to this whole blood moon idea that they've, they, that there are going to be a series of blood moons and it marks the end of, you know, the crash of everything and the end of time and all that. And so they cashed out all their investments because they, they didn't ready for that. The, I, there have been a lot of people who have wrongly used and wrongly interpreted predictive prophecy. Um, the fact that some people have gotten it wrong doesn't mean that there's not validity to it. See, and, and there are some of those things that it's difficult to know exactly what they're saying. But there's an inordinate amount of the predictive prophecies that are very clear. Jesus will be born in Bethlehem, or the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Not a lot of wiggle room there. He will be born of a virgin. Uh, you can't be half virgin. You, you, it, you, that's either true or it's not true. You know, and all the other very, very specific predictive prophecies that we've seen fulfilled. That doesn't mean there aren't some that you're going, oh, is that? I'm not sure if that granted. And some people have used prophecy wrongly, they use it to their own advantage, etc. etc. That doesn't negate the whole thing. People are always going to use things to their own benefit in wrong ways. 
including and sometimes even especially <coughs> scripture and the faith. Mark? Well, if you throw out enough prophecies and they're vague enough, then some of them will be hit, you know. But here, if we have a majority and they're pretty specific, like yeah. Bethlehem, uh, and, and the majority is already interpreted, and there's not a whole lot of other frivolous prophecies out there that we're on the right track. Yeah. It, Exactly. I mean, there are all sorts of charlatans in the world. And some charlatans are well-intended. They don't mean to be a charlatan, but they still are. Um, and it's the whole thing about, okay, you you have someone important in your life, and, and they have an E in their name. Uh, Mer Merle? Yes, Merle. <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds of hooey out there. But that, we're looking at stuff much of what's in the Old Testament, that there is no awful room, and the fulfillment was very specific and very accurate. And so that's why we believe that that's an apologetic aspect. Questions or comments about that? Okay.